Hi everyone and welcome to the webinar today. Uh, today we're talking about protecting your business from phishing and sort of what to look out for when you receive emails and yeah, I was just about to say. Okay, right, apologies, that was just a fire alarm test so we just muted the audio just to save your ears um, from that one. So yes, yeah, so today we're talking about phishing and um, how it's just sort of protecting your business, what to look out for, um, just give you a few tips. Um, and so today I'm with Tom, uh, Tom Cook Jones, my, uh, my co-pilot today, and he will be doing the technical side of things. So he's watching the comment sections. Um, if you've got any questions or comments or anything, just pop them in there anytime through the stream and either he'll answer them in the, in the chat or we'll try and fit it into the, the sort of the webinar at the same time. So yeah, any questions as we go, we will do a Q and A at the end, um, but do feel free to ask. Um, and I'm, I'm Will, um, I'm the customer experience manager here at Fasthost. Um, so yeah, I just say any questions, anything like that, let us know. We do, we'll do a Q and A at the, at the end, but yeah, any questions throughout, just feel free to pop them and pop them in chat. So first things first, what is phishing? Um, there, we go. there we go. What is phishing? Um, so phishing typically is the gathering of personal or security information um, through deception, um, most commonly through an email or a website. Um, so either they'll either you reply to an email with that personal information, or it links you to a website where you put in sort of credentials and things, thinking you're putting it into a legitimate website, but it's phishing for that information. The goal of phishing is to convince the recipient that the message uh, is related to something that they want or need, or it's something they really have to do right that second. Uh, so it could be a message from a loved one, from your boss, from a bank, etc. They get really creative with these. I've seen some really interesting ones from people saying they've been they've been kidnapped, all of these sorts of things. So uh, the the list of things that they will try to do to convince you it's real is fairly endless. Um, yes, very creative. Uh, but a phishing email almost will almost ask you to do it will ask you to click a link, download an attachment, or directly reply with some kind of information. Uh, and it really works. The reason you see so many of these phishing emails in your mailboxes is, is they do really work. Uh, they're extremely effective. Um, uh, even a small percentage of recipients respond, then that's an awful lot of information um, for the attackers. So in 2016, the Hillary Clinton presidential campaign was compromised uh, when 130 party employee mem email addresses were targeted by a phishing campaign. Very targeted. They knew exactly what they were looking for. And again, only one of those employees needs to be the weak link in that. And then... And it was. And it was. In well, that case, it was. It was one employee. Well, one employee. That was all it took. Yeah. And that's the thing. So the like, you look at it percentage-wise, you don't need don't need many people to, to respond for it to work. Um, in 2013 to 15, um, Facebook and Google paid more than $100 million to a fake company account after a scammer sent fake emails disguised as another company. Again, there would have been signs in there. It does, you just have to convince the right person and you can, they, can, they make an awful lot of money. Um, and in 2021, um, Colonial Pipeline was crippled by a ransomware attack. Usually that comes from an att email attachment. So it'd be, again, one employee uh, downloading a PDF or a document or something like that that, that looks like from a legitimate supplier. Really common if you're working in finance or something like that, invoices, all of those sorts of things. You'll be very careful about that. Um, but yeah, that one was a, a rather expensive one for them. A uh, nice $4.4 billion. Um, but again, one person. Um, and in 2022, there was 300,000 reported individual victims of phishing. So lower level, but just people who have put their passwords into the right into a phishing website or something like that. So it really can happen to anyone. And if you're running a business, obviously, this is why we need to be very aware of these things because um, internal security policies will make a difference. But sometimes that one employee can really... Uh, mess things up for you, I guess, is the, is the thing. Um, there are protections against one person messing up with like things like zero trust policies and things like that. But for the, most small businesses, the internal security policies probably won't be strong enough to, to stop this sort of thing. 
So what are the different types of phishing? So you've got the very top level stuff, uh, the email phishing, which is when a fake domain will be used to that, that mimics a known organization. Um, and that will just be used to send thousands of generic requests. This can also happen if uh, someone's domain gets compromised by an attack or something like that. That's, that's a common one. Um, so it doesn't necessarily need to be a fake domain, um, but it could just be a compromised one. Um, and that's just like a, a really scatter, scattergun approach to phishing and just sends it out to loads of people. And again, that you only need a few people to respond to to get what you need out of it. Well, you had one quite recently, didn't you? The TV license. Yes, I did, which I will come on to a little bit later on on this update. No, it's fine. That's fine. We can talk about it now. So that one was actually, this is a, a really good example. I really wish I kept it, but just deleted it, not thinking. But yeah, I got an incredibly convincing one from the TV licensing company. Um, and it was, it was from a subdomain so i'm not quite sure what happened there but it was definitely not legitimate and um, but it came from the tv licensing domain it looks really legitimate like completely in the same format as the other one so it's getting very sophisticated um, but of course my tv license was expiring within 24 hours of course why wouldn't it be um so yeah there's that urgency again and then we can see an example there of just that um that oh oh too quick on the button <laughs> just the um from a, a national security so this is just an example uh, of one that does the rounds and again you'll see the urgency in there um and trying to look legitimate and it, it, they are very easy to fool for so uh, another type of um phishing is spear phishing um so this is when it's targeted at a specific person so um we see these quite a lot within within larger organizations such as fast host i get quite often a, a, an email that uses my name and stuff just because i've got my name on linkedin doesn't take much to kind of put two and two together what my email address might be at fast host um and that would be more targeted um and again these are worse in a way because as soon as you get a something more personalized it just adds to that legitimacy um and again we can see in the example here it's um it's someone trying to down is it download the download the thing in it download yeah review the changes and sign your acknowledgements in the handbook so um and again immediately upon receipt of this notification so this again this is a real world example of a phishing uh, phishing um, email we can see here very targeted um at poor mr michael there um so other types of phishing so you've got whaling so whaling is similar to spear phishing so it's a, a targeting an individual however they're going after the bigger fish here so this is going to be someone with high trust in the organization um or someone with really high security access um and these can get very personal and um, these will be where the attacker has researched that company researched that person um and again will look very legitimate um getting close to catfishing at this point yeah. i feel um i mean it's quite effective because obviously if you're a ceo at a big company chances yeah. are you have quite a big public presence and yes a lot of information about absolutely and with the with the with every with all the social media nowadays it's very easy to find personal information about uh, about anyone you want to target so if you're uh, if you're a ceo or managing director or any kind of security um security expert within a company or you're just running a small company again you've got to be really careful about this because they can find a lot of personal information about you um so angler fishing now this more is cat fishing so this is uh similar to spear fishing but rather than sort of email and stuff they're using social media so it could be they create a fake account under a fake name of someone you might know um again that personal information comes into it um i've seen examples where they will pretend to be someone um, that the 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 attack the victim knows it could be a friend or even acquaintance or oh uh, you know we did business 10 years ago or something how are you and all these sorts of things so again social media very easy to fake accounts um but yeah that's that's worth knowing and then smishing and vishing i love these names these these names might not actually be the same everywhere you look at so these are like the common terms for them but you might see them um might see them referred to as other things but essentially it's just phishing done via text messages and phone calls and this is getting an awful lot more common nowadays so the number of whatsapp messages i get from unknown numbers now is really common um and it could be um a, a various but they're very personal so usually these ones will be um uh they'll they'll either pretend to have the wrong number or um it could be someone saying um that they're you know someone you know again this is just like they're normally quite personalized those ones quite a common one is like oh i'm 
uh, like, you know, I'm stranded out here. I need some money for a taxi. Yeah. Or some, you know, something along those lines. Yeah. Or well, the, the kidnapping one is like, oh, yeah, we've got we've got your someone yeah. you love and, you know, we need you to send us some money now. Um, and that one, again, invokes that panic. It's that urgency and that panic. That, that's what they want because the yeah. moment you're panicking, you're not thinking properly. And exactly. Um, the phone calls ones, we've all had them. Um, I know someone recently who got scammed by um, someone pre uh, pretending to be Mo2. It's a good example, actually, because this person isn't someone you'd normally have expected to get um, scammed by this, but they got lucky. Um, the, the person was on O2 uh, as a network and they were coming up for renewal. So they were expecting a phone call from O2 to kind of say, you know, we've got some good deals and things like this. Um, and in the end, um, what happened was she agreed to a new contract. They were, you know, putting all this information in online as a new account with O2. Uh, she it, she didn't request the she didn't request a new phone so um the, she would just they said oh it's eight pound a month got an email about ten minutes later saying oh your new phone's due for delivery uh in the next few days and then this is the this my the, 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 this is how clever they are nah, she asked to speak to her supervisor when she was doing this just because she couldn't she could understand the person she was talking to so yeah obviously the supervisor gives her his personal number. So every time she's got a problem, she's like, she phones his supervisor back on his personal number, which she's not verified. You don't know if that's an O2 number or not. So you've got to be really careful with numbers that you phone and um, always verify a phone number. Um, but yeah, that was, um, and then basically what happened, phone got delivered um and then she rang the person back that the number he she'd been given he said don't worry i'll get courier to collect it obviously it was just some guy in a white van comes and picks up the phone and that's the, see you later because it was like a new iphone it's like 1700 pound or something like that and obviously then she did phone o2 and they're like yeah we've got no record of this so i think i think something to be mind of, mindful of is if you're ever given if you're ever in one of those situations and you're given contact details to contact yeah always ver either verify those contact yeah. details and see if you can see them like on an yes. official website yeah or even just go through whatever they call their official channel i.e you know yeah. if you get given a number for a supervisor instead just call the support center back yeah. and ask to speak to that supervisor yes. rather than calling out direct number yeah it's just it's always better to be safe verify 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 yeah. um but yeah that was um the, the only th the, the ones that are difficult to do is when you've got fraudulent transaction on your phone on your card quite another again a common one that catches people out is obviously if you get a phone call from your bank um saying you've got fraudulent transaction on your account and i before, I'm, i need you to verify your account before otherwise it's going to get locked let them lock your card um i just say look i'm not willing to give you that information over the phone i will phone the number on my card um and deal with it that way and, and any legitimate bank will commend you on that yeah, so absolutely. be very careful about those ones um i've had those before as well and again you straight away panicking because someone you're thinking someone's got your card so yeah. um uh can we not is there a problem with the audio mm, not sure give me a second there was two seconds i'm just seeing comment on tom's screen check. here saying yeah. the mic is off i'm definitely seeing we're getting audio on can you just streaming the stream? somewhere yeah i'm just gonna mute the stream very quickly Bear with us two seconds. Uh, two seconds. If you can't hear us, you're not going to hear me saying that anyway. Bear with. Okay, I'm just turning up very slightly. Just if you can hear me, just let me know. It's going to be a delay on the stream, though. Yeah, so. there will be a slight delay. It might have just been I was a bit quieter than you. I think. Okay. Was it just you? Oh, it's all right. Yeah. It's only Tom. I can definitely hear you. You can hear. Oh yeah. Well, I think everyone can hear me. I get told off for having a, a booming voice on a regular occasion. Okay. Yep. Okay. All good. All right. Perfect. Brilliant. I do apologize good. for that, guys. Yeah, the... Thanks very much for the heads up. Yeah. Thank you for the heads up. Yeah, it's quite difficult. We've got everything muted in here because yeah. otherwise we just hear myself talking and no one really wants to hear that. So, <laughs> yeah. okay. I'm going to move on um, from those different types of fishing. So how do you know if it's phishing? Well, we've kind of talked a little bit about this kind of as we've been going through. Um, but what is the email about is the first thing. So they're always, almost always want you to download an attachment, enter in person information or click on a link or a button and it's going to feel urgent. Um, and that should be your first clue. Any email that comes out of the blue that asks you to do something urgently um, because either your account's been compromised or something's going to get deleted or something like that straight away red flag um, 
so yeah so again with that tv licensing email i got my it was going to expire within 24 hours no one's going to give me just 24 hours to renew it they're going to give me a little bit more of a heads up than that no yeah it would yeah you would have had a notice like prior to that yeah, absolutely that, not 24 hours yeah um, so public domain names, so if it comes from Gmail, Yahoo, etc. Now, this isn't necessarily so common nowadays because they've been very good at, at clamping down on this, but some phishing campaigns will still, will still use public email providers like Gmail just to the ease of use of setting yeah. up accounts, or they've got someone's comp they've compromised someone's account, which is probably more likely nowadays because usually there's restrictions on new accounts and things like that. Um, but it's more common that a compromised domain name is going to be used or it's going to be something that's close to the spelling of um of a domain name. Now I will admit that I've been fished one day. Uh, just woken up. I am not a morning person, um, and I had a I had a, an email from Microsoft saying my account had been accessed, and it come it come from it was like it, it was limit it was close to live mail or something like that. So yeah, I got fished. Um, luckily, I changed my password very quickly when I realised what I'd done. But yes, again, you've got to be really careful with those domain names. Um, but yeah, they normally come from either a close domain name to 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 one you'd expect or compromised. Because if you can get if they can hack someone's account, they can bypass any DKIM or SPF or DMIRC because it's going to be coming from the the source that it expects to. But when we say compromised, that means someone's had their account hacked and lost their username and password or something like that. So they can verify against the sending server that they're sending from. Um, but it still looks legitimate because it's a, an actual domain name rather than one of the public domains. Um, spelling or grammatical errors, I kind of like just said there. Um, spelling errors in the domain name or um, they're just really subtle ways to hide it. It does happen sometimes. Like you, Most domain registrars, like us, for example, if someone tried to register, uh, I don't know, Google, but G-O-O-G-E-L um, dot com or something like that, it's going to flag it. Yep. Um, but they will still slip through, um, especially for smaller companies um, that aren't necessarily quite so big. Um, so it's always worth just checking that spelling as well because if that TV licensing one, maybe it came from a different one, but it certainly looked like tvlicensing.co.uk. Um, spelling errors in the content of the email is another clue. I've got another example in a little bit that I'll kind of show you that subtle, that subtle like kind of language or, or, um, or spelling errors. Yeah. Uh, subdomains. Now, this is what was the was what I have, think I happened with the TV licensing one. So, a more a less common method um, is to use a subdomain. Um, so, like you can see, I may receive an email from accounts.tvlicensing.co.uk. Now, this can be done to bypass some of the protections against spoofing that those companies might have. So, um, in the DKIM, SPF, DMARC. So, what that tends, to, what those, what those are, is email authentication methods. So. Um, the domain owner will set up a policy that basically says email that comes from my domain can only come from a certain sending server in the case of SPF and um, the IPs if it comes from a, a fake seller a fake server somewhere else then it's going to get blocked um, and DKIM is digital signing um, but in the DMARC policy if it's not set up properly it actually is still possible to send from a domain name um, a subdomain sorry and not have and still have it delivered even though it's actually um, failing the DMI, uh, D, um, DKIM or, or SPF. It might just go in your junk mail instead, but even still, um, you know, it's worth looking out for. It's not super common, uh, but it's worth noting. I, my one came from epp.tvlicensing.co.uk. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, if it's unsolicited, that's going to be a big red flag as well. So did you expect the email? If not, treat it with caution. Yeah. Always treat everything with caution is is really kind of what yeah. it comes down to. But I think especially when we're talking about like uh, banks and you know, that, that kind of thing, that like they're, they're, they're the sort of companies that wouldn't, I think that usually they have a warning that they'll give out, which is like, we'll never... You know, ask we'll never you ask you for this information. information. You know, we'll never ask you for personal information. Yeah. Um, we have a similar thing where, we'll, you know, we'll never ask for that, that kind of information. So, um, yeah, it's it's if, if anyone is ever asking you for this information ever via email or, to be honest, in any kind of format, treat it with caution. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Okay. And um, move on to the next one. So this is what I was just saying about a um, slight example here about this with the really subtle um, kind of spelling errors and stuff. So this is a legitimate scam, a uh, little legitimate phishing email. We got uh, one of my colleagues um, from Simon Yeoman, um, who is our managing director. So when someone's scam, it, when someone's sending a, a fake email, it's really easy to fake um, that the display name you can see at the top of this email. So that says Simon Yeoman. And again, you can put 
any e- you can put any email address in the from address when you send an email. So spoofing is very easy. Um, but here it's come from um, a Gmail account. Um, yeah. So automatic red flag. But if you hadn't looked at that, sometimes if you're looking at an email on your phone or something, you're just going to see Simon Yeoman. Um, so it's always really, really important to check that because yeah, because say that email address we were this was on a desktop uh, Gmail client, um, but yeah, that wouldn't show on a mobile, I don't think. Um, so that's really ca- that's a real warning sign for that. Um, and then you can see the, the 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 content of this high Ethan. So it's used this first name straight away. It's 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 a targeted one. Um, I hope you're good. I'm meeting and I need, so you can see that I you know, don't actually know if you can see it because it might not be high enough resolution, but it's a lowercase i um, yeah. and some of this language is just a little bit off to what we would expect from Mr. Yeoman. <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah, I need you to drop your WhatsApp texting number. I mean, it's just not... It's not there's not a normal way of phrasing no. that sentence. But as AI gets more prevalent, these yes. sorts of things are going to be harder to detect because you know the the, the fishing the people doing fishing are going to be using AI to to make it sound. This has always been a really key indicator: is the language used in an email, and yeah, AI is going to make it harder to detect. So it's probably also worth noting that obviously there's a big red banner well, on this one. I mean, yeah. um, <laughs> so in this case, <laughs> would you this or a red flag? It was, yeah, it was uh, quite easy to uh, yes. already uh, be suspicious, uh, but that's not always going to happen that like when it comes to spam and spoofing and all that kind of thing it's like it's a constant arms race between mail providers yeah. and people trying to you know do illicit things with emails so sometimes uh you know google sometimes will pick it up you know sometimes we will but sometimes you won't um and that's just that is just the nature unfortunately of yeah of of uh, the the uh, spamming industry so yeah but yes you would do well not to ignore these warnings oh, yeah. um, i have known people to just ignore these warnings you should not. They're there for a reason. Yep. Sometimes stuff gets mismarked, but you know, if, if you're getting a, if you're already a little bit suspicious, that should definitely tip you over the edge. Definitely. <laughs> okay. So on the next one, how did they get my password? So this is a, a common email scam. So I thought it's worth just shoving in, in this webinar is um, you'll receive an email that says, um, I know I, hi, I'm whatever, whatever their name is. Um, I've been on your phone. I've got access to your computer. And to prove it, here's your password, and it'll it'll be there in plain text in there. It's not always it doesn't always do that. Sometimes it just it says it might just say, "Oh, I've done all this to your computer. I've had access yeah. to it for months and had stuff like that." Access to your webcam. Yeah, yeah. And obviously, they would stuff. obviously email to let you know this. <laughs> yeah. um, but don't panic. Um, they're counting on you panicking because let's be let's be honest. You get that sort of email. It is a little bit scary. I remember the first time I got one, I was like, "Oh, that's not good." Mm. Um, but yeah, usually no action's been taken beyond sending the email. Um, if the email came from your own address, it's just been spoofed. Um, and even if you're like, I get my own address spoofed. I'm on out. I, my personal account's on Outlook. Um, I still get messages from myself. Uh, check your sent box. Basically, if you check your sent box and there's no sent email there. Yeah, it's been spoofed. Um, the way they do that, the way they get around that is by compromising another account in Outlook and then using that to send as the from address, yeah. if that makes sense. Yeah, does that make sense? Because yeah. that bypasses the the DKIM, the DMARC and all that sort of stuff. So yeah, it looks like it's come from myself, but actually, no. If you look at the email headers, you can tell that, but... It's, yeah, that is that that is why the SPF record exists. It's yeah. exactly to stop that sort of thing from happening. So yeah, but there if, are ways around it. There are ways around it, but by and large, having an SPF record should should yeah sort that out. Yeah. Um. So yeah, on any account or service that uses that password, obviously change it straight away. Um. Despite whatever they say in the email, if you had been hacked, they wouldn't tell you via email. Mm-hmm. If they've got access to the, your phone, they could literally just pop up a message on there or something like that. Yeah. So. And also, yeah, no hackers telling you an email, sending you an email saying they've hacked you. Yeah, if, um, they, if they were on your computer system or something, you, you know, you'd be looking at like a ransomware attack or something like yeah. that. They'd be doing something where you're forced to, to interact do whatever. With them. Yeah, you yeah. have to do it. Yeah, ransomware yeah. on your computer, send me this, or yeah. I'm not going to unlock it. So, by yeah. all means, still treat it seriously, but yeah, yeah it's it's very don't unlikely. panic. I think is there. Well, there are. So there's a lovely website here. Um, we had a debate about how you pronounce this um, just before the webinar started. Yeah. So uh, have I been pwned.com is what I think we settled yeah. on. We, um, um... Some people would say have I been owned.com. Um, just, uh, but yeah, have I been pwned.com. I don't know if you want to pop the link in the... Yeah. Um... I mean, we can we can go on to it in the stream. Yeah. Oh, okay. Have, yeah, we got, yeah. have you got an email address we can... Um, you're willing to... Oh. I'm talking... 
maybe i don't know but put my put my fastest one i don't mind that yeah. one I, that one i know has definitely been pwned a bunch of times so let's i'll do um it. i'll put this link in the chat so it's, it's, it's a very useful tool if you're getting um a lot of spam it's a very useful tool to put your email address into go on you can uh, use my work email address put your work, use your work email. i know it's compromised a bunch of times it was in... uh, let's go let's do it so this is the website and all you do is you put in your email address. I'm going to put in Will's. Will dot Is it Will? Yeah, I think that one. It both work, but yeah, the so one that's been compromised is Will dot. It's going to be a bit worrying if you have been. Yeah, but uh, I, I, all my email addresses have been. Put, oh yeah, oh, no, I've been owned. So this is an amazing website. Yeah. Um, legitimately, the, the creator needs a lot of kudos. Mm. I can't really see your screen very well from here, so you can you can okay. you can share to go through. Yeah, the, go on, yeah. share how I've been compromised. Go on. So basically, what it does is it uh, it kind of it, when a company um, discloses that they've been involved in a data breach, um, this website will pick that up and it will see if you you know if you have your email addresses connected to these companies in any way. So you had this email address. Um, so that, that was back in 2013. And the, and the thing is, is what's happened here is that uh, what the actual breach was, like what information was released. So in this case, it was your your username, your email address, which is mm, yeah. uh, as soon as your email address is released like that, um, that means it's almost certainly going to be on a list that someone's then going to use as as uh, a spamming addresses. I do receive all the spam. Yep. So that, that's that's how that works. You know, you got you got some other stuff as well. Like, what's, what is, what's Cov? I don't Cov? know. I don't even remember. Don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so it's it's a really good way to kind of go through and um, what well, what I've signed up for now. Well, first of all, what you signed up for, but second of all, <laughs> um, uh, it's a good way of actually checking to see you know if you are getting all these kind of emails then this could be why so it's worth having a look to see yeah but yeah i'll uh we'll stop judging you I, I genuinely can't even remember what that one is <laughs> who even knows I'll have, a, I'll have a google after this um okay so where are we if you're concerned about the state of your other, okay yes so if you're concerned about the state of your other accounts say fast face banking etc uh, yeah contact the company and speak to an advisor um it won't be their first time we deal with this Day in, day out, bread and butter. I'm pretty certain um, the guy who deals with Fastest is watching this stream because he did tell me he was going to. And I did have him check my content as well. Um, so, yeah, we, we we deal with this stuff all the time. Um, if you're not sure, just just ask us yeah. and we'll, we'll put your mind at ease. Um, and, and the same with all your banks and all those. They're, they're happy to deal with this stuff. Absolutely. Uh, what I would say, sorry, I keep jumping in. Uh, what I would say is definitely when it, when it comes to being like whether whether you should be concerned about the state of your other accounts um obviously the recommendation is never to use the same password in multiple yes. places if you have used the same password or you're not sure that's the point when you should be concerned and yes you should go ahead and change those passwords yeah yeah so that's my last my last little point i had on here which is yes reusing passwords with different accounts so we talk about the blast radius here so Whenever you get compromised, um, not everyone calls it the same thing, but the blast radius is how big an impact that can have. So if you've got different account, different email address, not a different email address, because that's not really, really super uh, useful. But if you've got a different password for every account you sign up for, the blast radius is going to be small. If you get lim link in one of those hacks there, my Adobe, for example, if, if my password had been leaked, they couldn't access my my work any of my work accounts or anything like that um it's only going to be my adobe one and they could only really see my terrible drawings of whatever i've been drawing in photoshop so you know blast radius isn't going to be too bad um i guess the issues there may be around sort of billing the information and stuff like that but yeah in term if i had reused passwords in theory they could potentially access some of my work stuff if it wasn't locked down on on ip on uh, lands and things like that so again from from that perspective is is really useful yeah. just to use and I, and again interestingly i can't remember it's the next slide i talk about that a little bit now we talk about there's um there's a bit of a generational sort of divide um, in some of this stuff, um, which I'll come on to in a little bit. Um, bit I always thought it was quite... One. Yeah, it's, it's, it is unexpected, but it's complacency. Complacency <laughs> is what catches you out a lot of the time. Uh, but how not to get caught out. Um, the most important point is to remain vigilant. So they, these phishing methods are changing all the time. I've given you some examples in this webinar. The scammers are cleverer than me. Uh, cleverer than me. No, I can't even say cleverer properly, so point proven, <laughs> I guess. Um, but yeah, it's... Um, 
th they are always on top of the game. They will find new ways to 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 outsmart us. Um, and every, every time there'll be every every email you get that's phishing has been successful at some point. That's why it's being reused again. So remain vigilant. Remember, AI is going to make this sort of stuff harder to detect. But yes, remain vigilant. So the things you can try and do to protect yourself. So spam filters. Almost all email providers have them. Um, Fastos accounts allow you to change the spam filter setting if needed. That's your first line of defense. And um, they'll get most spam, uh, most phishing will get picked up in spam. Um, check for the common phishing clues. So spending mistakes, unsolicited emails, sense of urgency is always a good one. Um, check your sending, check the sending domain name thoroughly. And um, just make sure that you're um, just looking for those little spelling errors and stuff like that. Um, and if you're unsure about an email from a company, find their contact details on their official website. I can't stress this one enough. This is a, a, a one that catches people out quickly. Yeah. Um, if it's a friend or colleague, give them a message and call to double check. So again, the kidnapping one, phone the person. Don't panic if they don't answer straight away. Um, but yeah, there's it, like with Simon, that email from Simon, Simon, did you send me this email? Um, yeah. You know, if it, 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 he says he's in a meeting in the email, which is actually a nice touch, to be fair. Um, but yeah, you you verify it with someone else. Is he actually in a meeting? You know, you go and speak, just try and speak to him. Just be really careful with this yeah. stuff. Um, any phone numbers listed in any emails, just check them before calling. You can usually do it on a website. Yep. And just be really careful about it. Um, but yeah, those are the, the things to kind of check out for. One common one um, is uh, when... Someone knows you've got a big bill coming up, could be a buying a house or something like that. And um, they'll send you an email saying, oh, but the bank details have changed. Yep. Verify it with the company you're dealing with. That sort of thing is like, it's just super important. Verify is kind of the... the That's thing. exactly what happened when we were going through the examples that the Google, Facebook... Yeah. 3.3 yeah. to... Change the bank million. details. That was what it was. It was an email that someone sent saying, oh, these are the wrong details. These are the new ones. Yeah, the supplier and details. They were just so busy that no one thought to check. Um, no, yeah. And again, it could yeah. be something simple like you've said, "Oh, I'm moving house on 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 your um on your social media or something yep. like that," and automatically, see, I'm thinking, "I've got an idea." Absolutely. So yeah, just verify, always verify. Um, and the last slide I wanted to talk about is just making so cybersecurity key part of your business. So this was really interesting, which I wasn't expecting. But so a study by the National Cybersecurity Alliance. This is American, worth bearing in mind. It's not necessarily the same in the UK uh, or any other countries you're watching from. Um, but it found that Gen Z and millennials are more at risk of falling victim to cybercrime than any other generation, which you wouldn't expect. Like we've grown no. up with this stuff. Um, I think, are you Gen Z? Uh, I think I'm like technically like I'm technically. I'm like I'm the first. Yeah, all right. I'm the first wave. Of yeah. Gen Z. Okay, okay, fair enough. And I'm uh, I'm <laughs> I'm a millennial, but you we we know about this stuff, right? But there's the problem. So we've grown up with this tech. We use our phones to check our emails. You can't you can't check the links in a thing very easily. If you, in a, on a computer, you can hover the mouse over a link. Mm -hmm. It tells you where it's actually going rather than what it actually says in the text. Um, there's complacency in there. So. Because they've grown up with it so much, and we've grown up with it so much, we just there's there's just a level of complacency around. I, I, one of the in the study, one of the the comments was one of the people who'd been surveyed was just just said, "Yeah, I use the same password for a lot of accounts because I've got so many. It's just easier." Um, so there is an element of complacency in there. So the the awareness of attack vectors is good, but the rate of security is less important than other generations. Again, it's just it's just that level of complacency. Yeah. Um, and a key factor in that, using the phones a lot more. So you can't check links. And I could showed in that Simon Yeoman email, you're going to see Simon Yeoman on your phone. You're not going to see the full email address unless you actively check. Um, so it's interesting. The reason I raise this is because I think certainly in some companies, the expectation is that the older generations maybe would be the ones that would feel full victim to this. And that, that complacency is very dangerous. Yeah. Um, so no matter how old your workforce is, how tech savvy they are, basically make sure you've got secure, strong security policies in place and make a security a key part of your culture. Yeah, don't be complacent. Just remind people um, all the time. Yeah, I mean, it's what well, we have. We have regular courses that we have to go through on a regular basis yeah. we're going through all this sort of stuff so that, you yeah know, we is... do cyber security on on a, a lot of the time yeah, yeah. It, so it's, it's there's no there's no complacency right? it's, 
but that's, that's the point. It has to be reinforced yeah. on a regular basis. And also um, look at your policies for um, security as well. If you can limit access down to, to what people actually need, there are some really, there's, there's a whole webinar to be had on internal security policies, but there's things like zero trust policy, which is where it's um, like people have to re-verify for everything. No account has got privileges above what it needs. Um, we're really guilty of that, not necessarily here, but I mean, just as a, in general, a collective of people, mm. um, people will be overprivileged a lot of the time. Um, I can think of a bunch of examples where someone's just been given admin access to something that they shouldn't have been given admin yeah. access to. Again, not within fast. Like, yeah, yeah. I'm just talking generalization here. Um, but yeah, you, admin access and, and they get compromised. And again, we're talking blast radius. It's going to be a big blast radius if you've got admin access to something yeah. they shouldn't do. Um, my kids are the, are the ones at the moment for if we're trying to teach them about this sort of stuff is uh, if they've got um, accounts on your computer and stuff like that, you can limit down admin privileges. So if they do click on some kind of dodgy ad where it's telling them they're going to get a bunch of Robux for free or something, yeah. You know, they're, they're not going to they compromise the entire computer because they've got admin access, for example. Exactly. Um, so, yeah, security policies are really important. Um, uh, don't ever be complacent. Um, but, yeah. All right. That's the end of the of the, of the the content that we had. So we'll do a Q&A session now. Um, if anyone has got any questions, feel free to ask. And there's a, is there anyone watching today? Oh, yes, we're well, watching. Got, okay, some, cool. Yeah, we've got got a few people in yeah yes yeah, so, oh yeah any questions you got feel free to fire them in pop them in the uh in the youtube comment section yep. and and also or just email them to my email address that i just shared with everyone <laughs> <laughs> you might just open yourself up to a bit more spam there, <laughs> yeah I, honestly the amount i get how many have been compromised what how many security breaches of my Four. email been yeah my you should see my personal email account <laughs> that's a lot more i've had that since i was 15 or something yeah. like that so i've had it for over 25 years been in multiple security yeah. breaches so i have a, a very old email address that was set when i was a teenager and i don't it's not i've not used it in years but i logged into it for the first time the other day and it was like oh okay this is <laughs> this is a it's a bit rough yeah tons of spam yeah but yeah i still got it my site my, my old hotmail account i'm kind of proud of it and kind of ashamed of it at the same time so you just had a question in uh, will you be installing AI to monitor for scam emails? Um, maybe. I'm not sure. That would, be... it would definitely be a product question. I mean, is there? Then it's definitely something. I'm looking at spam stuff at the moment, so yeah. I think um, I'm guessing AI is going to factor into that a yeah. lot. But and I know, yeah, I know that the company as a whole, you know. I think all companies as a whole now are uh, gotta. realizing that AI is, you know, gotta. is the future. So, yeah, um, yeah, I, it would not surprise me if we were looking into initiatives like that. Yeah, um, there's no immediate plans. No. Um, so I've got, I'm looking at our roadmap, it's certainly not going to be in the next sort of six months or so, that's for yeah. sure. Um, but it certainly would be a good one to look at. Oh. Should you password managers like, ah, uh, yeah, okay. Absolutely. I'm look, I really need to get my eyes shut. <laughs> I'll, I'll read them out for okay, you. Okay, yeah, I'll probably be good. Uh, should, I'll, I'll just read out the question. Uh, should we use password managers like RoboForm? Uh, I don't know RoboForm. I don't know. I use a password manager, so I use anyway. Bitwarden. Um, that's not necessarily a fast host uh, recommendation, just as a personal recommendation. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Bitwarden's really good. Um, what I would say is what our policy is at fast host is that we don't use... Uh, web based not web like you are um ah what's the word for it browser based so yes you get autofill in google for example not necessarily a great substitution for an actual password manager yeah. because if your computer gets compromised your passwords can get compromised as well that's the only reason they're not necessarily insecure or anything like that but we would tend to internally we aren't allowed to use browser based um password manager um, when I say browser based, that's going to be the the autofill in the Googles yeah. and stuff like that. So I use Bitwarden, which is I can access uh, online. Yeah. Um, I, it's good. I, I don't have any complaints with it, but I suppose I don't know whether it's good. <laughs> I think it, I think it's secure. Um, it's definitely one that I've heard a lot. Yeah, it, it's got it's really well reviewed. But yeah, password managers are fantastic. Yeah. So again, I've probably got about hundred passwords in mine, um, and it. It means I don't have to reuse passwords because I can just log into my password. I only have to remember one password, 
very strong, nice password um, that I only have to remember one. And then, uh, yeah, it's, it's much easier. And then you can just use that to manage all your accounts. So I would strongly recommend the use of a password. I thought I'd put that in the thing, actually. Um, I would definitely not. say do your research into the one you're going to yes. use, though. Just make yeah. sure that you're totally happy with it. It meets the requirements that you have as well. Yeah, they... Funnily enough, the the security um, the security community are very hot on uh, on password managers yeah. and what they would recommend, um, and the reputable ones will have a good reputation within the security community as well. Definitely, because um, there's loads of really cool stuff in there, like the the password hash and strength of it, and how much they uh, the salt and pepper. Uh, mm. I don't really know a huge amount about that, but there's um there's a lot of interesting ones. That's a that's another topic. There's a really interesting yeah. ones like the salt and pepper and stuff like that. Yeah. Love it. How can the subdomain get set up if the scammer doesn't own the main domain? Ah, okay. So basically, when you send an email um, from a browser or a uh, well, not so much a browser-based one, but say you've got Outlook, for example, installed on your on your computer, when you send an email, you can put whatever you want in the from um, in the from headers. So email is inherently easy to spoof, um, just because it's really easy to do that. So I could send an email right now pretending it was from Bill Gates at Microsoft.com. There is nothing stopping me, no inherent overall thing in the world that will stop me from doing that. The protection will come from Microsoft.com themselves, who will set up DKIM, DMARC, SPF, and all of that sort of stuff to actually stop. Because um, when I send that email from my computer or whatever, I'm not going to be able to send it through the Microsoft SMTP servers without knowing the password for Bill Gates at Microsoft.com, which I don't know, actually. It's strange. Um, but so basically, the DKIM, the SPF, will pick all that up and it will block that email because it's come from a source that isn't authorized to send emails from Microsoft.com. So when you come, when it comes to subdomains, again, you could just do exactly the same thing, bill.gates at admin.microsoft.com, and I'd be sending from that subdomain then. Um, and if they haven't set up their DKIM and SPF and DMARC app properly, that can slip through the cracks. It's probably going to end up in spam um, because default um, would the default settings for that sort of stuff would would probably mark it as spam. But yeah. still, they can slip through. It's not super common. Um, but again, there can be gaps in DMARC and, and DKIM and stuff like that. Yeah. And, and sometimes uh, if the policy has not been set up properly, it, it usually happens when you've got a really like a quite a big organization with a really complicated DMIRC policy, which then in subsequently makes it easier to find gaps in it because they've got a really complicated setup where sometimes they're sending from main domain, sometimes they're sending from subdomain, and the policies can get a little bit wishy-washy. Like I say, it's not super common. You won't see it a huge amount, but it can happen. Yeah. Uh, so it's worth noting. I use eWallet, which is not cloud-based, but on my computer and mobile. Is this as safe as cloud-based password managers? Yeah, should be. Yeah, in I, theory, I don't, I don't know it. In I don't know. You, I'm do, not aware of that. You can't one. answer this one. I'll get you. I'll give it. I'll give it. Then you can. That's all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I believe in um, you. I think whether or not it's cloud based or not um, probably doesn't have a huge amount of impact on how safe it is. Um, like the safe, like if it's cloud based, then I think the thing you need to bear in mind is that your safety is now reliant on a third party company because it's them managing, you know, where where that data is held. If it's on your if it's located directly on your device, um, then you are fully in charge of that security. So that's kind of the way you got to look at it. But it being on a cloud-based platform doesn't necessarily mean it's any less safe. If that company is reputable and they've got really good security policies, mm -hmm. then it could potentially even be more safe depending on what device you've got it on, that kind of thing. Yeah, um, so I think, yeah, with with my bit, what, sorry, were you finished that? I was, I was. Well, you actually got, I feel like I just uh, interrupted and <laughs> I stopped finished. talking. I want to talking. <laughs> <laughs> um, with Bitwarden, the, the way it works is you've got a vault, essentially, and that vault isn't stored um, it's it's stored. I think it's off stored offline. And when you connect to it, the you kind of think you download it. I, do you know? I'm not 100 percent sure. Essentially, cloud based is still going to be super secure most most of the time um, because the 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 vault that your passwords are stored in are going to be encrypted usually at least yeah. 256. Um, I, I, the ha password hash. I, I I feel like I got that totally wrong. Essentially, the cloud based ones are uh, inherently there's going to be yeah, another element of someone being able to download it, but if they can, if they download your, if they somehow hacked Bitwarden, downloaded all the, or downloaded all the, everyone's vault, they'd still have to get into the hashed, yes, like the hashed account. So, which at the moment with, until we get m more powerful computing and you've got a strong password, it's going to take them like 
billions of years. So yeah. it's pretty good. Offline actually is not probably the, the most secure because like probably. Tom says, you, you can't, yeah. if, if it's on, if you've got it local on your phone, on your, or, or on your, on your desktop, it's not actually available for someone to, to no. hack offline. You're not, you're not rely, relying on someone else to, to not get hacked, but. I guess it kind of boils down to either you're in charge of the security process around it, or you're leaving that up to the third party company. Cause if it's on your device, then it's your responsibility to make sure that you're keeping that device up to date. You're keeping, you know, yeah. you've got all the security stuff you need on that device. Um, and again, when it comes to utilizing any of these services, I think the, the best advice we can give is just make sure you do your research yeah. because you know, um, yeah, it's, you're very, I think doing research, you'll very quickly find out which are the reputable brands and which aren't. Yeah. So, um, yeah, agreed. So d d d we've got Dave again, and he's saying the employee, especially directors are generally the biggest risk. Should all businesses do pen testing? Oh, that's a good question. That's a good question. That is a really good, I like that one. Um, pen testing. I mean, <sighs> You could, I mean, I, I don't think you can really give a definitive answer to that. Um, it's going to depend on various things, like how exposed you are to certain risk. Um, personally, I think if you've got any kind of, um, what's the word for it, any exposure to, to, on, to sort of where someone can access you from an outside environment, Pen testing is probably useful. It's expensive though. So this is going to be, this is going to be where it comes into it. It's going to be, is the risk high enough that it's worth spending the amount of money it's going to cost you to pen test? Yeah. Um, it's going to depend on the size of your business. Um, it's going to, so like if I'm just a sole trader, right, working at home, I'm probably not going to get pen tested realistically. No. Um, I, I don't think there's that. If I'm, Take, if I'm a website and I'm taking customer payments and I've got customer details, yeah, I'm probably going to pen test mm -hmm. um, because there's a lot of there's exposure to to the outside world there. Yeah. I've got an online mm -hmm. presence. I've got a website that in theory could be hacked. Yeah. So yeah, probably pen testing in that sense is useful. The problem comes a little bit with pen testing is that you could pen test today and then a year down the line, there's been so many updates and exploits and stuff found that that actually that pen testing is no longer useful. And if you spent a few thousand pounds on pen testing and, you know, it, it, it yeah, I mean, it, it's going to come down to a personal choice. In an ideal world, yes, if you've got any kind of exposure, yeah. um, pen testing is, is useful. In a practical situation, it's going to depend on what kind of data you're handling, um, essentially, especially if you're using third-party tools pen tested as well. Yeah. Something to consider is like if you're utilizing a lot of your own, then pen testing becomes of a uh, more of something you need. To... Yeah, if you're using a lot of third party uh, tools, then if they're you know if it's big business tools, and chance are they probably do their own pen testing anyway. Yeah. Um. But again, yeah, it's it's uh, um, there's no real unfortunately like, easy answer to no. that question. It's no, it's very dependent not. on it's the circumstance, exposure, and risk. Um, I would say if you're if you're a, a larger business that is handling customer data, yeah, um, then yes, I think that that's the point where, and if you're storing that customer data in some way, um, obviously being GDPR, GDPR compliant, yeah, um, then yeah, maybe pen testing is something that you uh, may need to look into. Um, but yeah, like I say, it's 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 very uh, situational there. Yeah, it is super. It, I mean, using your phone is a good example. Right? Your your phone is exposed a lot yeah. to various things, but. Android gets pen tested all the time. It's getting yeah. pen tested by ethical hackers. It's getting pen tested by actual companies. So kind of like the the all the updates and things address that. It's usually from a result of pen testing or something like that. If a, mm. if a what, generally speaking, if you get um you see it sometimes a, a really big update comes out because it's an urgent security fix that's normally been found by ethical hackers pen testing, and then they've released the they've released the information. It's a really interesting world actually, mm. the ethical hacking and stuff like that. But yeah, I mean, I can't give you a definitive answer for that. Yeah, I but hopefully that helps a bit. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, hopefully the, the scenarios we've given kind of will give you an idea of whether that should be something you need to consider. So, uh, was that the last question for now? That's the last question for now. We've um, got about, so we've probably got about five to ten more minutes. So we'll see if any more questions come in in the next few minutes. Yep. 
if anyone's got anything else, I hope yeah. I, I don't actually think I said thank you for coming either, which is just yeah. unbelievable. <laughs> yeah, like, where am I? Now? Where are my manners? <laughs> well, if I just see the viewer, if the viewer figures dropped off loads because it's the Q and A, and I'm like, oh no, I didn't say thank you. Um, but yes, thank you for coming along um, to everyone who has uh, viewed today. Uh, we do really appreciate it. Um, so yeah, thank you for coming. Uh, if you're not going to drop it, if you have got any more questions, please do feel free to ask. By the way, we're not disappearing for a second. Um, but yeah, yeah, do thank you for coming and, and interacting. It's really nice when we get sort of comments and questions. Yeah, I do like it's one of my favourite parts of doing these live sessions. A bit of interaction. And it's uh, worth mentioning we do these on a monthly basis as well. Um, so we, uh, if you actually look at our YouTube channel, you'll be able to see. And in the live section, you'll see the last uh, few streams that we've done. Um, and yeah, we've got we've got a few more lined up as well. I think the next one is that is the next one set in stone. The topic? No, no. Okay, I won't mention that. Won't mention that. <laughs> we could we could probably say what yeah. it's likely to be. Okay, okay. Thanks, Irene. Yeah, thanks for stopping by. Yeah, thank you. We appreciate. It. I keep looking. I'm looking over here. I'm, I'm no, the, I just know. the camera is here. Yeah, we need the like screen a, is there. I know. Like yeah, a monitor down there. That's I know, like not so bad. Really so I, I don't know if this is my good side or. <laughs> So we find out um but yes thank you for coming i appreciate it yeah should we mention what the next one yeah i think you have to now Do I? Oh, okay right so it, we are considering our next topic being uh how to actually utilize ai uh to help you when it comes to building a website um and looking at all of the kind of different tools that are available when it comes to doing that um obviously uh we are gonna have to consider the the ethics behind that as well um so it's going to take a bit of research to make sure we're giving you the right information and information that's going to be really useful to you um but yeah that is hopefully i think hopefully it's probably going to be our next one yeah. now yeah i think we've kind of i think i'll set in stone now so. <laughs> i think that one is set in stone now yeah. oh cheers dave thank you for stopping by and thank you for your questions as well you yes really good questions really there. appreciate you appreciate you all right i say i think we'll give it to all five two yeah um, that means we've got to talk to each other for three minutes if there's uh, no more questions though Oh, we could sit in awkward silence with Reppin. Uh, I don't know. No, okay. <laughs> what should we say? I don't know. If anyone, actually, it's a question. If anyone has got anything they'd like to see in these mm. webinars, um, please do feel free to put it in the, yeah. in the comment section because we kind of do what we think people want to see. Um, but yeah, if you've got any any ideas that you would like to see, let us know. <laughs> We can AI them. is a minefield. I am already looking forward to it. Well, yep. That's oh, why I'm almost slightly dreading it as yeah, well. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I, do you know what? I, I feel like this might have been a terrible yeah. idea, you know. But it was your idea. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I think it'll be good. I think yeah, it's, no. a, it's a hot topic. I think Definitely. it's one we want to address. And it's such a powerful thing. To, it's so useful to be able to, yeah. to, to use it uh, to, to some of your website stuff. So, And I mean, I think whether, whether, whether you like it or not, whatever your feelings are about it, it it is the future. It's not going away. It's yeah. It's there's not there's going just away. too much. There's too much money in it now. No. It's, it's yeah. either going to be the end of humanity or the savior of humanity. We'll see. There's going to be so, literally no in between. It's one or the other. That is it. And I'm, I'm so, it's a real nice positive point to end the stream on it <laughs> at lunchtime on a Tuesday afternoon. I know. So. A bit of existential crisis. <laughs> why not? That's what we, if that's not why you come for a webinar, why not? <laughs> why else? Uh, I think we're, yeah. but yeah, I, I'm I'm looking forward to it. Be interesting yeah. doing the definitely the kind of the bits and pieces we need to. But yeah, I think, um, maybe we could maybe we could get AI to do the whole webinar, like pretend like oh, should we just do an AI we'll deep fake it? Oh, I was, I was thinking just literally just have AI generate an entire webinar and just oh, see how it goes. Oh, that would actually be content. really interesting. This, is, this, is, this webinar is entirely generated by AI. Oh, I kind of like it. That could be quite interesting. We're not going to do that, but I actually quite like the idea. Are you saying that so people don't come along to the next one and expect it? Or <laughs> no, are you saying we're not I, doing it? I don't know. I, no, I don't think we should. <laughs> okay, all right. I kind of want to do it, but I don't I think I kind of do as well, but... I kind of feel... I, I feel like, like it'd be a good experiment, though. Yeah. Like, no, I think you it... did the disclaimer, like, everything in this webinar yeah, is generated end, by ID. Like, I, ID? AI? Yeah. 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 I think it would be an interesting concept. Definitely. I kind of want to test it now. Oh, I do. Right, it looks like we uh we've got some viewers dropping off. So I think now's probably a time to say uh to call it quits, I think. Yeah, that's and, uh, five two. I don't have any questions. But yes, thank session. you again, everyone, for coming. We do genuinely appreciate it. And thank you for interacting on the comments yeah. as well. It's in it's been it's been fun actually. That's yeah, it's been I enjoyed one. this one. Yeah. yeah. I think it's there. Cool. So yes, thank you all for coming. Um and yeah, we will uh we will see you soon. Uh, the next one, hopefully. Catch you then. Take care. Bye.